is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first uh, question is to the Premier. It looks like another stressful week for students and parents. Yesterday, Catholic teachers ended negotiations, saying that they were frustrated by the Ford government's insults and attacks and lack of any proposals. Elementary teachers echoed these same concerns. Meanwhile, the Premier claimed parents are telling him, and I quote, keep going, do not back down. As parents watch talks break down and classroom cuts take their toll, does he really expect us to believe that parents are sending the government messages of support? The question is to the Premier. To you, Mr. Speaker. I'm hearing that everywhere I go in the province. I guess I just, I just don't hang out with the heads of the unions. That's what I don't do. I talk to the real people. And I'm not, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, I'm not beholden, and neither is our party, to the heads of the unions. We're beholden to the teachers, we're beholden to the parents, we're beholden to the students. That's what we're focused on. But I did talk to a, a single mom the other day, a single mom that her sick days and vacations expired. So guess what? On Friday, she Order. never got a paycheck, Mr. Speaker, because the unions decided to go on strike. It's time, it's time the unions put the students over politics and compensation and work with the government to keep these kids in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. We were protecting full-day kindergarten, maintaining the smallest class sizes in Response. Canada for early years. It's a fact, the smallest classroom sizes for early years. We're investing more in math and special education to make sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next the supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier should have been here on Friday to talk to 35,000 students, parents, and teachers, or any other place in the province where hundreds of thousands of folks were walking the picket line against this government's cuts to education. On this side of the House, we thought that the Premier's claim, however, uh, was very uh, unbelievable. In fact, we asked everyday Ontarians what they thought of it, and here's what they said. Kyle told us, quote, uh, parent here, big nope. Investment in education, pay, uh, invest in education, pay public sector workers fairly, and build the province up instead of tearing it down. And Kim sent us a note that said this, and I quote, This parent strongly disagrees. Our kids and our future economy need investments in education, not the harmful cuts this government is imposing. I support Ontario's educator, uh, educators. Uh, are Kyle and Kim wrong? Question. Premier. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, as they had 35,000 people down here, there was hundreds of thousands of people in the back of factories that had to take time off that can't afford a day off. It's costing them personally. It's costing their families. It's tough enough Order. to get ahead under, under the NDP and the Liberals, how they destroyed our province over the last 15 years. Mr. Speaker, we're listening to the parents and the students, and we have reasonable bargaining at the table right now. We reduce class sizes from 28 Order. down to 25. We reduced mandatory online learning from four to two courses. Mr. Speaker, we're working day in and day out. I know my champion, and he is a champion, yeah. Minister Lecce, is at the bargaining table working hard to keep the kids in the classroom. Final supplementary. Well, I don't know why the Conservatives are having such a hard time with this speaker. Monique told us, not our Monique, another Monique, told us, quote, Order. I haven't met a parent in the secondary system yet that says yes to bigger class sizes or e-learning. Fiona reached out to us to say the Conservative spin was, quote, funny because anyone I talk to, parents, kids, teachers, are deeply worried about what's happening. Again to the Premier Speaker, the Conservatives have called teachers fat cats. They've called them babies, and they've called them thugs. Don't they think it's finally time to spend a little less time name-calling and a little more time actually listening to what families really want? Order. Sure. Members will please take their seats. Order. I recognize the Minister of Education to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's time to get a deal in this province. That is why we went to the negotiating table yesterday to get that deal. We tabled reasonable, positive proposals that are good for students. Let me enumerate what those were. We committed to keeping classroom sizes low. We committed to protecting full-day kindergarten in writing. We committed 100 percent 
investment in special education funding, in fact, providing more funding in spec ed services. Mr. Speaker, in this negotiation, we committed to a fair 1 per cent enhancement of compensation for education workers who we value, who are friends and our family. Mr. Speaker, we're asking our union partners to work with the government to put students over union interests and rejoin our efforts to keep kids in class. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you kindly, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Parents, students and teachers have been very clear. They see the cuts in their classrooms, teachers getting fired, and a government that doesn't seem to have a strategy besides do not back down. Does the Premier really think that's what parents want? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, parents want a deal that works for their students, not for the unions of this province, and that's what we're advancing at the negotiating table each and every day. Mr. Speaker, we went to the table yesterday to get a deal. We gave our negotiating team the ability to drive that outcome. And yet, even still, with a commitment to maintain full-day kindergarten, with a commitment to keep classroom sizes low, with a commitment to ensure 100 per cent investment in special education funding, more money in spec ed services, even still, compensation remains the true issue at that table. A benefit ask, an enhancement to benefits when we know students need more supports for them, for their success, and for their future prosperity. Mr. Speaker, we're going to fight for students each and every day in this negotiation. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I want to share another note that we got from a parent named Catherine who wrote us to say, and I quote, I'm ashamed and embarrassed that my Ontario government is behaving so selfishly and irrationally. It's time to stop behaving like middle-aged frat boys with a superior, superiority complex. Stop putting our children last. Isn't it time to listen Order. to everyday Ontarians like Catherine, or is this government going to continue to, to act like and pretend that they know best when it's obvious they don't? Minister of Education. Speaker, we're going to continue to stand strong in the defence of student interests over union interests each and every day in the negotiating process. And parents expect that. They want the system to work for their kids. We are spending more in education, a 60 per cent net increase Order. since 2003 4 And yet the question for parents, the question for every parent in this province, do you see the comparable result? Do you see an improvement in that investment? The, the point is, for our government, is we expect better. We are committing in this negotiation to keep classroom sizes low, to ensure full-day kindergarten is protected in writing, to invest 100 per cent more money in special education. And yes, Speaker, we ask for a 1 per cent consent by the unions of a 1 per cent increase in compensation. This is a fair deal for workers, but most importantly, it's a solid deal for students. It's time for the Order. unions to work with the government, to get Response. back to the table, to negotiate in good faith, and get a deal that keeps kids in class. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, no amount of uh, accolades that this government gives itself uh, is going to drown out the fact that the all-star Minister of Education and the Premier don't have a clue what everyday families are. Order. Order. I need to be able to hear the member who has the floor, whether they're asking a question or whether they're responding. And I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Please start the clock, and I'd ask her to place her question. Thanks. I think we need a Zamboni driver to replace the uh, Minister of Education here in the province of Ontario. But look, the fact of the matter is parents don't want classroom cuts, Speaker. They don't Order. want mandatory e-learning or larger class sizes. They don't want 10,000 teachers to be fired. And they don't want an education minister attacking teachers that he's supposed to be getting a deal with. It doesn't work that way, Speaker. You don't poison the well and then expect to get a deal. So will this Premier stop pretending that parents are on his side? Stop pretending that educators are on his side. Cancel the cuts. Replace this minister, even if it means with a Zamboni driver, and work on actually getting a deal done. Thank you very much. <laughs> minister, reply. Mr. Speaker, 
I find the cult of personality obsession by the Leader of the Opposition, the Union Presidents, about me you know, is really unhelpful. With respect to the Leader of the Opposition, with respect to the Leader of the Opposition, Order. it isn't about you, it isn't about me, it's about our kids, and it's about time you accept that. Mr. Speaker, take their seats. In, the the interest, clock. in the interest of our students, we're proposing a solid, positive deal for our kids. We're going to keep classroom sizes low. We're going to commit 100% investment in special education. We're going to keep. We're going to maintain full-day kindergarten. And, Speaker, we're going to offer a fair 1% enhancement to our workers. I want a deal. This caucus wants a deal. Let's get it done. Order. 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 The next question, the member for Kiewetanon. Good morning, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the OPP arrested Taitanega Mohawk land defenders. I asked a question about uh, what the Premier knew about the police action by the OPP and what, I, and what role did he, his office, or cabinet play. I'm not sure if I got the answer, so, Speaker, I ask again. Was the Premier briefed about the police action prior to the arrests and the dismantling of the protest camp at Wyman Road? And has the Premier or members of the Cabinet been briefed since the arrests were made? Minister of Indigenous Affairs, to reply Thank you, Mr. Government. Speaker, to the member opposite, here's what we knew. We knew that it was important to be respectful, to support, encourage, and facilitate Indigenous leadership uh, to help, to, to help uh, uh, address this situation, Mr. Speaker. As time wore on, uh, we protected, Mr. Speaker, the principles and the recommendations of Wash. We don't provide instructions to the police, Mr. Speaker. In stark contrast, we worked closely with people on the ground. Uh, to ensure that we had a peaceful outcome, Mr. Speaker. We're satisfied that we went to the farthest lengths possible to achieve that end, Mr. Speaker, and we hope that we can move forward, not just with Indigenous leadership, uh, not just with the members of that community, but across this province to ensure that these kinds of uh, uh, events are, are handled more appropriately from all sides in the future. Thank you. The supplementary question. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have to understand uh, these demonstrations are the result of 150 years, uh, but instead the Premier thought it was good to say enough is enough. The, uh, the illegal blockades must come down. Since the arrests yesterday, there are now more protests. The streets in front of the Parliament Hill were shut down. The International Bridge in Sault Ste. Marie was shut down. Community members have shut down Highway 6 at Six Nations and the rail line at Hamilton. Speaker, we're aware what the Ipruwash inquiry concluded, and I hear a lot of words about dialogue with hereditary chiefs, hereditary leaders, and respecting indigenous law. So I ask, what has this government done beyond these words? Well, thank you for that, Mr. Speaker. And we've, as a government, we've taken across the ministry approach a whole of government to ensure that Indigenous people have their rightful place in just about every piece of legislation and policy option that this government is moving forward with. Take, for example, the Far North Act, Mr. Speaker, a piece of legislation shoved down the throats of uh, the isolated remote northern communities by the previous government. Absent of any consultation, we are now working directly with them through the NAN leadership to ensure that decision making moving forward, Mr. Speaker, is shared between the government and the Indigenous communities, wait for it, who actually live there, Mr. Speaker. I was in Thunder Bay just last week announcing $1.5 million to mobilize more than 300 people to work, Mr. Speaker, on the East West High. We went to the Anishinaabek. A training center there at the Thunder Bay Library to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that there are resources Response. to ensure Indigenous peoples, young peoples in particular, are mobilized and ready for a new workforce, a new complexion of a workforce all across Northern Ontario. I have a list here, Mr. Speaker. It's very long. Hopefully, I'll get enough. Thank you very much. Next question, a member from Mississauga East, 
Cookster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I'm proud to represent the great people of Mississauga, and in particular, my constituents of Mississauga East Cooksville. As we know, Mississauga is the sixth most populous municipality in all of Canada, generating $55 billion per annum of economic output. Under the previous Liberal government, Mississauga was continuously taken for granted. Economic and business leaders have raised concerns about the policies put in place by the Liberal government, which prevented growth and made life harder for citizens. Premier, can you please elaborate to the legislature how Mississauga is turning around economically thanks to our government? Premier. I want, I want to thank not just an all-star, all-star champion from Mississauga East Cuxville. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to the policies of our government, Mississauga is booming economically, like the rest of this great province. Yep. Here, here. Mississauga Corner. was recently ranked the most business-friendly mid-sized city in the Western Hemisphere, Mr. Speaker, by the Foreign Direct Investment American Cities of the Future report, out of 421 locations in North and South America. That is an incredible feat. Mississauga also placed fourth in economic potential and third in cost effectiveness and connectivity. Mr. Speaker, our plan to build Ontario is working. Our economy is firing on all cylinders. Response. Over 300,000 three, 300, new jobs have been created in Ontario since we took office, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. That's 307,000 new opportunities. That's 307,000. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Premier, thank you for the support you are providing to the people of Mississauga and to the rest of Ontario. You are right, Mississauga is turning around once again. We are becoming stronger economically with more people finding work and being able to provide for their families and loved ones. The city of Mississauga's business community is made up of over 98,000 businesses, 1,400 multinational firms, and 76 Fortune 500 companies. We are a major economic hub in this province, and our government wants to work with Mississauga and champion our entrepreneurs and business leaders. Premier, can you share more information about new economic investments and the companies Question. who are now investing in Mississauga? Thank you. The Premier. I want to thank our, our great MVP from Mississauga. Mr. Speaker, Mayor Crombie had Order. a great stat, which he shared the other day. Mississauga creates 27 new jobs every day. That adds on to our 500 a day we create across the province. This builds to the great news of Ontario's economic strength, new jobs being created. Think of this, Mr. Speaker. A new job is being created here in Ontario every three minutes. As we sit here, new jobs are being created. Just past December, Bombardier announced Mississauga would be home to their new global manufacturing centre for its global business jet series. This is a massive investment of $350 million, Mr. Speaker. Response. That is going to be high-paying jobs, hundreds and hundreds of high-paying jobs. And another great company, Concentrex, is creating 300 new positions in Mississauga. They're opening up every single day. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, while your government is doubling down on the rollout of your partisan plates, the problems multiply. From DurhamRegion.com, Stephen Kemp, Durham Region's Manager of Traffic Engineering and Operations, flags that there is a problem with the design and, quote, when it says Ontario on the plates, it's very small. When the provincial officer looks at the image, they can't always see Ontario. And, quote, Minister, you've blamed the manufacturer, but then tell us they stand by the plates, that you stand by them, but the government house leader says they expect the company will foot the bill for the repair and placement of the plates. It's really hard to keep up. And how did we get here? Who was responsible for testing? The minister said in an interview that this government did testing. She's never said anything about 3M's testing. So who was consulted during your government's exhaustive testing, and where is the proof 
of any testing, since they don't work in bright light, dim light, at a distance, in Durham, Toronto intersections, or in the sun, will the minister please tell us, if you can, where do the plates work and how can you back it up? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to be perfectly clear at this moment. I'm going to be very, very pointed when I say we take the concerns of Ontarians very, very seriously. We're listening. We continue to listen, and we are taking action with our partners. I am telling you, Speaker, I'm so appreciative of the fact that our partners are working around the clock to address what we've heard. And through this process, our government is working with and incorporated feedback from public safety stakeholders, our partners in terms of processing. I can assure you 3M is working diligently alongside us to again address the concerns that have been shared. And we are going to be rolling out and keeping everyone updated on our progress in the days and weeks to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I hope that they'll reconsider and hand over the proof of that testing. But, Speaker, this morning we read on WKBW Buffalo that the U.S. side of the Canadian border, quote, Supervisory CBP Officer Michael Taylor said U.S. Customs and Border Patrol is aware that some of the new Ontario license plates cannot be read by the automatic license plate readers at the border crossings, end quote. Taylor says wait times haven't been affected yet because there have only been a handful of plates at the border so far. And yet, Speaker, this government is still putting new plates on the roads. They are doggedly clinging to the hope that people will love these plates and maybe, by extension, love them. Give us a real answer about how many white plates are still in stock that could be used. The minister says, we're listening. We're hearing. But, Minister, people need you to be looking and seeing. So open your eyes. Will this government please stop wrecking things, stop scapegoating, be responsible, and stop putting these unsafe, problematic partisan plates on our roads? Minister to reply. Most importantly, Speaker, we're doing. We're taking action and we're listening and consulting with the people that matter in terms of making sure that Ontarians have the, the type of plates that embrace technology that take us into the 21st century. And also, we all also need to ensure that people understand that their voice matters. And again, I can't stress enough, Speaker, Order. that we are listening. And we are taking action. And again, we're standing with 3M, who have assured us that they will deliver an enhanced product in the weeks to come. So, Speaker, again, I look forward to continuing to update this House and the member opposite as our progress continues. And again, we are taking action, and we will be delivering an enhanced product in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. It is the responsibility of this House and all members to raise matters of public interest and importance. It is our responsibility to seek to end injustice and to debate policies, but on Indigenous policy, we have been silent for far too long. It is past time that we create a standing committee on Indigenous relations in this House, a standing committee where Indigenous peoples may be heard policies examined and deliberated and solutions found. Speaker, we cannot be silent any longer. I've called upon the Premier to act and create a standing committee on Indigenous relations, for without honest, ongoing and respectful discussions from all sides, the mantra of reconciliation is empty and hollow. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs to reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Lanark Front, uh, Kingston, for the motion that he tabled uh, this morning. I understand it will be debated uh, at second reading on March 5th, and I look forward to reviewing it in, in some detail uh, and getting some reflections and input from all members uh, of, uh, of this place, and in particular uh, from my Indigenous critic on the content of what he's put forward. I can say, Mr. Speaker, that this government at every turn, as I mentioned in a previous uh, response, has taken the opportunities, Mr. Speaker, available to us to work directly with Indigenous communities on major policy positions, Mr. Speaker, and economic development, and we continue uh, to be hopeful that this relationship will uh, be ongoing. We've had Indigenous leadership host proactive receptions here, Mr. Speaker, to build relationships. 
and uh, we hope that moving forward, Mr. Response. Speaker, we will continue to make all of these uh, opportunities uh, with Indigenous communities and leaderships a top priority with this government. Thank you. The supplementary question. Again, to the Premier, and I, and I appreciate the Minister's response, but I believe the supplementary is deserving of a response from the Premier. The people of Ontario expect their government to uphold the rule of law. They un understand there are inequities and strains in our relationship with Indigenous peoples. The conflation of facts and opinions that surround this relationship make it difficult for everyone, Native and non-Native alike, to have honest discussions and debates. I've asked today that the Premier create a standing committee on Indigenous relations. It is overdue. The committee must have the discretion to investigate related matters and report back to this House for open debate. It is not my ballot day on March 5th, Minister. We can do this by unanimous consent today. Thank you. Minister to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, re re regardless of the specific date, I think the official opposition and the Indigenous critic would have some important things to say. There's a preamble here as I look at the, the, the motion or the letter in, in, it, in its content. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, some of the subject matter, I think, uh, could and should be discussed. Indigenous land claims. This government is moving at the fastest pace that I can recall in federal time and provincial to settle those land claims. Indig Indigenous impact benefit agreements. Mr. Speaker, we've moved forward on a number of key legacy uh, infrastructure um, opportunities with Indigenous communities all across Northern Ontario. The development of resources on Native lands. The Ministry of Natural Resources through uh, dealing with the Far North Act directly with Indigenous leadership, Mr. Speaker. Education and curriculum. We move forward uh, with uh, reciprocal education Response. policies and embedded, uh, Mr. Speaker, Indigenous history uh, mandatorily in, in, uh, in, in, in the uh, curriculums of elementary uh, and in secondary students, Mr. Speaker. So these are all important subject matter, and we'll look. Thank you very much. Next question the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when I got elected, I spoke to too many constituents who spoke of a broken employment system. In fact, the Auditor General reiterated this when she said that only 1% of people on social assistance were finding work each month. Mr. Speaker, with one job being created every three minutes across the province, and with our province's largest chamber of commerce finding that 82% of businesses polled reporting having difficulty recruiting and finding new employees. So my question to the minister is, please explain how our government is making the system work better and how are we supporting those people who are trying to navigate the employment system? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, getting people into jobs is our top priority for everyone in this government. Mr. Speaker, when job seekers have trouble finding work, while jobs go unfilled right across Ontario, it's clear that the system we inherited isn't working. It isn't working for employers who need workers or for workers who need a job. We've engaged three different system managers to make the system work better. They will be funded on whether, on whether they actually help people find jobs. Mr. Speaker, jobs are important. They put food on the table and a roof over families' heads. More so, having a job gives you a sense of dignity. We need to do everything possible we can to help people find good, stable jobs in Ontario. A supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It's exciting to hear how the government's helping connect people particularly our most vulnerable citizens, to jobs. I think to my local constituent, Jim, who spoke about how he struggled navigating an employment system that separates Employment Ontario, ODSP, Ontario Works, often administering overlapping and conflicting programs. Even as the government supports a competitive business environment minister and makes investments to help people prepare for jobs, the old system failed to help people find those jobs. Could the minister please share more on how our government's changes will help workers across the province of Ontario, like my constituent, Jim? Thank you, Minister. Minister. I'd like to thank the member uh, for that supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, helping people right across Ontario and every single community is why we're making this change. 
the system managers will find local solutions to local problems. Instead of being rewarded for failing while following processes laid out by Queen's Park bureaucrats, they'll be accountable for finding people work. The first communities to benefit from this will be Peel, Hamilton, Niagara, and Muskoka, Kawartha. Job seekers in each region will benefit from a one-window approach for ODSP Order. and Ontario Works recipients. Order. Mr. Speaker, we want everyone in Ontario to participate in the prosperity that's happening since Premier Ford got elected. Mr. Speaker, over 300,000 people are working today that weren't working 18 months ago. Wages Fonts. are going up for the first time in a decade, Mr. Speaker, and for the first time in 30 years, we have the lowest unemployment rate in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. Today, the Patients Ombudsman released its report. They received thousands of complaints pointing to one thing. The strain on our health care system continues to grow and after years of cuts from the Liberal government. But instead of fixing the Liberals' mess that left us with hallway medicine crisis, ballooning wait times for long-term care, and a shortage of qualified personal support worker, this government has cut more from the health care budget, ignore the needs of the front lines, and prioritize the reorganizations of the health care system above all else. Ontarians tell us that we need more investment in health care, not cuts. Premier, will your government listen and provide the necessary health care investment in the upcoming budget? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and I am very familiar with the work done by the patient ombudsman. I thank them for their report, and I look forward to reviewing the details of it. Uh, the, the work that they are doing is really important for the people of Ontario. However, it is my hope that over time, with the new local Ontario health teams coming into play, that they will be able to rectify a number of the concerns that have been relayed by the uh, patient ombudsman report recently. We are actually increasing investment in health care services in Ontario considerably by $1.9 billion this year over last year. This is a huge increase in volume. And it's not just the amount of money that's being invested, it's where the money is being invested. We want the money to go to frontline services. That's what the people of Ontario have told us over and over again. The transformation that we are working on right now with the local Ontario health Response. teams, where those teams plan and provide the services and fill in the gaps that have been identified by the patient ombudsman, are going to result in high quality connect. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This Conservative government moves fast when it wants to, like when they release the vanity license plate that can be read. But the Conservative government is missing in action when it comes to helping everyday Ontarians. For example, when they seek help to care for their elderly parents, like my constituent. 87 years old Bertha, who refuses to leave her long-term care room, who refuses to eat because she misses her husband, Real, 89 years old, across town away from her in a different long-term care home, unable to reunite them for the last 13 months. They are missing in action when people need help to pay for their medication. The Ombudsman's report also pointed that not too many people even know that they can seek the help from the patient ombudsman. Perhaps that's because the position has been vacant for nearly two years. Wow. Why Question. has the Premier taken so long to even start the search for a new ombudsman for our health care system in crisis? Minister. Well, the patient ombudsman is a very important position. The uh, search has started. There is an independent group that is taking a look to select the right person to be the next patient ombudsman. However, the work in that office continues. There's no slowing down of the work that they are doing. However, in terms of what we are doing in the Ministry of Health, I can tell you we are taking swift, swift action. We have talked to thousands of people across Ontario. We know that there are concerns that people, when they are leaving hospital and need home care, aren't necessarily getting the services that they need. They often don't know who will be coming to provide the home care, when they will be coming, or who's providing the service. That is changing with the new local Ontario health teams. 
people will know before they leave the hospital who they will be connected to for home care, and they will be followed for that to make sure that there aren't complications Response. that are going to bring them back into hospital again. We are taking action on primary care. We're also taking action on mental health and addictions care. Our plan will be released very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, when you announced that OHIP Plus would no long, longer cover medication for those who had private insurance, you re reassured families and their children that any additional costs not covered because of those changes would be covered. Speaker, a family recently from Oakville contacted my office and shared their story on how they are now forced to pay nearly $500 per month for a required prescription of a nutritional formula for an autistic child. While OHIP Plus used to cover this, they are no longer eligible because of their private insurance. To the Premier, why is this family forced to pay nearly $500 a month when your government promised Ontarians that the changes to OHIP Plus would not result in a loss of coverage? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. OHIP Plus does cover most, uh, virtually all of the costs that people will incur. If people are not able to pay any additional costs, of course, there's always the Trillium program that they can apply to. That is what we promise the people of Ontario so that we don't want people who don't have insurance coverage to have to pay those additional costs. We would be happy to take a look at that particular circumstance because we are aware of several areas that were, people were concerned about where, where we have provided coverage. But in this particular case, I'd be happy to speak to you about it to make sure that we are able to provide that person with coverage if they're not able to pay for it themselves. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we actually did reach out to your office because I thought maybe something was overlooked, maybe there was a mistake that was made, and the answer that came back from your office was a big no. These cuts are part of a bigger pattern that takes place here in the province of Ontario over the last 20 months where we've seen cuts to after-school programs, teachers, library, autism services, complex special needs, even cuts, Mr. Speaker, Order. to children breakfast programs. Premier, you made a promise to Ontarians that they would not lose coverage. You made that promise that they would not lose coverage and, uh, to o with OHIP Plus. If that was true, why is this family now forced to pay almost $6,000 a year for a prescription that is necessary for the, the health and well-being of this child? Speaker, the Premier made a promise to Ontarians, so will his government reconsider Question. these cuts to OHIP Plus so that his family and many others will have coverage restored? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Health to reply. Again, without understanding the particular circumstances of the person that you're describing here, I can't make a comment on that. But what I can tell you, and I would be happy to, to discuss it with you afterwards, but what I can tell you is that we want to provide more frontline coverage to people, more services for people, more prescriptions for people. That's one of the issues that we need to discuss with the federal government, quite frankly, is more prescriptions for, rather than a pan-Canadian pharmaceutical program. Let's talk about the issues that are really in concern for governments across this country, which is rare and orphan disease drugs. Those are the things that we are finding it increasingly difficult to cover. It's wonderful that these drugs are being discovered, but they are Order. incredibly expensive. That Order. is a good point for, of discussion for us with the federal Order. Order. Member for Don Valley East, come to order. The member for Don Valley East, come to order. The Associate Minister of Energy, come to order. Apologize to the Minister of Health for interrupting her. She can conclude her response. Thank you very much, Speaker. In conclusion, uh, the issue of rare and orphan disease drugs and other drugs that might not be covered uh, under the provincial program right now uh, will be discussed with the federal minister. That is a good point of discussion for the provincial territorial ministers with the federal government when we have our first meeting, which should be coming up within the next month or so. We need to start talking about the things that are really in issue for provincial governments, and I know from my colleagues that that's certainly one of them. Response. And something that I certainly intend to present when we do have that meeting. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you so much, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the minister. The member for Don Valley East, come to order. The member for Don Valley East is warned.
Once again, I'll explain what we do with warnings. If I have to speak to the member again after the member has been warned, he will be named without warning, without further warning. Please start the clock. I apologize to the member for Burlington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. The Babcock family saw firsthand how a lengthy and exhausting legal process to obtain a death certificate can make an already devastating life event even more challenging. In July 2017, an Ontario jury heard sufficient evidence to find that Laura Babcock had been murdered even though her remains had not been found. Although a court convicted two individuals of, of Ms. Babcock's murder, her family faced many challenges registering her death because her body was not found. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us more about the Babcock's family's advocacy work that spurred changes to how the province facilitates death registrations in, case, in cases where a person disappears in circumstances of peril and no remains are recovered? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Burlington for asking this important question because, again, it demonstrates how our government is listening and taking action. And I'd also like to share my appreciation with the Babcock family. You have been amazing advocates, leading with your heart, to ensure that no other Ontario family experiences what your family went through. You know, the bureaucratic barriers made the grieving process for the Babcock family more difficult than it really needed to be. So Laura's parents wrote to our government asking that something to be needed to be done and asked that Ontario families have an easier path to take when they find themselves in very unthinkable, unfortunate situations, Speaker. So I'm pleased to share with you, Speaker, that my ministry worked alongside the Office of the Attorney General to introduce Spons. changes that have made death registration processes less burdensome and more compassionate. And I want to thank the Premier. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Centre. I want to thank— Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the situation that the Babcock family went through is heartbreaking. Can the Attorney General tell us about the steps our government has taken to ensure that no other family in the Babcock's position will have to endure a lengthy and complicated course of action in order to complete the death registration process? The Attorney General's reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Burlington for, for the opportunity. And I want to extend my, my deepest gratitude to the Babcock family for raising this issue with our government. Our government has made changes to the Vital Statistics Act that amend the death registration process to ease the burden for families faced with registering the death of a loved one in, in the absence of their remains. Laura's Law, as we have named it, in honour of Laura Babcock, would provide a simpler method for families to obtain a death certificate in tragic circumstances. This change will provide tools to the courts, in particular Crown attorneys and judges, to facilitate the registration of death in these cases and ensure that families have the necessary support. Laura's Law will ensure that in the future the death registration process is less burdensome for families who experience a similar, unthinkable tragedy. And, Mr. Speaker, the coordination between ministries and the leadership of the Premier Response. is critical in making this happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question's for the Premier. Stephen Gracchi, a resident in my riding of Humber River, Black Creek, saw his auto insurance premium jump by 20% just before Christmas, despite having a clean driving record. Turns out Stephen's not alone, because both the Liberal government that was here just earlier and the current Conservative government have allowed auto insurance premiums to go up nine consecutive times. Since the Premier campaigned on lowering auto insurance rates, can he tell Stephen and the rest of us why are our auto insurance rates continuing to go up just like the Liberals did before them? Minister Finance to respond on behalf of the government. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member for his question. And yes, dealing with the auto insurance uh, rate issue has been an issue that's been a top priority for this government. Mr. Speaker, you'll remember the new blueprint that was released in our two 2019 budget 
addressed in a very systematic and, and appropriate way the things that will lower costs. The things that will lower costs like increasing competition so that we have the best products for, uh, for, uh, for drivers. Making sure that consumers have choice Order. so that they have choice in terms of the products that they can choose from and, uh, and that they can make decisions that make the sense for them. We've launched the new FISRA, the new, uh, the new regulator committee, which is working with the insurance industry, working with advocates, working with the assessment industry, working with the trial lawyers, but most importantly, working with drivers to making sure that the products are offered, offer a choice for consumers, and that that will be the, the key to addressing this rate problem. And we'll have more to say about that in the, in the weeks and months to come. The supplementary question. Speaker, I, I submit that their auto insurance blueprint is the same shade of blue as the license plates. It's non-existent. We can't see it. Um, but thanks again. Dr. Fred Lazar, an economist from the Schulich School of Business, recently released a report which found that Ontario drivers may have overpaid on auto insurance by at least $5.6 billion between 2011 and 2018. Yet the most recent Ontario Road Safety Annual Report revealed, and this is important, that the number of injuries on Ontario roadways were at their second lowest since 1964. In fact, for the last 18 years, Ontario has had the fewest road fatalities in all of North America. Something is not right when Ontario drivers are among the safest in North America but are paying the highest auto insurance rates. I guess that's just Tory math. So can the Premier tell us why Question. he's continuing the failed Liberal legacy of gouging Ontario's drivers? Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, and, I, and I'm happy to, uh, to provide a little bit more background for the member who might not remember that it was the NDP government that brought in the no-fault program. Oh. Mr. Speaker, the no-fault program that still chose to include, interestingly, Mr. Order. Lazar, of course, was working for the trial lawyers uh, who, uh, who continue to, to offer the tort system within that, that failed system, Mr. Speaker, that was the beginning, the beginning of almost two decades of, of a failed approach, an approach that we're correcting, that we're correcting by by making sure, as I said, Mr. Speaker, that we offer consumers more choice, uh, that we understand the balance between the important rights of victims, but also the need to make sure that a no-fault system works. So, so, Mr. Speaker, that's what the blueprint lays out, and we'll be continuing to make progress in that, offering choice for consumers, making sure that there's competition within Response. the insurance market, making sure that the assessment system, again, a legacy of that failed no-fault system, is corrected so that drivers can be treated fairly and we put drivers first. Here, here. The next question, the member for Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, this government is taking hallway health care seriously. We are getting our hospital the resources they need, like this year's $384 million increase in funding. Our government also invested $68 million in small, medium, and multi-site hospitals to start addressing the previous government's inadequate funding formula. Patients need more options to receive the care they need. One such option, Mr. Speaker, is home care, where patients who are well enough to leave the hospital but still need assistance with some day-to-day -day tasks. Mm -hmm. Can the minister tell this House about the issues mm -hmm. some patients are currently facing? Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much to the member from Milton for your question. Currently, those seeking home care can face multiple assessments and long waits. That's why our government plans to bring in an outdated system designed in the 1990s into the 21st century by integrating home care with the rest of the health care system. It's clear that we need home care to help us end hallway health care. One reason the home and community care system is not meeting our needs is because outdated, rigid legislation is creating needless barriers to care and stifling innovation. We need to take action. Right now, far too many patients fall through the cracks or are left trying to navigate the system on their own. Our government's approach will put patients first Response. and help them to get the connected and responsive home care that they need. Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your work on this file. I'm happy to hear that our government recognizes these issues and that we're taking action. Understanding these issues with coordination and the current over, currently 
very restrictive legislative framework, it is clear that the new approach is needed. Right. We have consulted across many sectors to find innovative solutions for other issues facing our health care system, and home care is no different. Can the minister tell this House more about our plans for the future of home care and how to improve the system so that these long-standing problems are finally resolved? Minister. Thank you again to the member for your question. We want our home care system to provide the best possible care to anyone in Ontario who needs it. We intend to take action on a number of fronts, including the launch of the local Ontario health teams to aid in the coordination of care. Our government will seek to make targeted financial investments and modernize the procurement process. We also know that we have to address human resource shortages in the home care sector by making sure our personal support workers are able to make the best possible use of their time and their skills. Our government will continue to advance effective solutions to the issues facing our home care sector right now. I look forward to providing more details on the changes to our home care Response. system later today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, I'd like to tell you about one of my constituents, Gordon McDonald. Gordon is a senior living in Kitchener who's been driving since he was 16 years old. He's a good driver and doesn't have any driving offences. He was shocked when he went to renew his auto insurance this year, and his insurer wanted to increase his rates by 21 per cent. That's hundreds of extra dollars a year Gordon will have to pay out of pocket for auto insurance, even though Ontario already has the highest rates in the country. Does the Premier think it's acceptable that Gordon is seeing his auto insurance rates go up by 21 per cent in one year? Yeah. Minister of Finance for applying to ask the government. Mr. Speaker, Rising auto insurance rates are an issue for people in Ontario, and that's why this government has put forward a blueprint, a plan to address them. The origins of that issue are the failed policies of the former New Democratic government. When your failed approach to no fault sure. insurance, order, was, yeah, and, and, it, and it goes that, that far, when your policies sure. failed to address some of the systemic issues, following on by, by the previous Liberal government, who time and again, time and again, cut benefits and tried to solve the system on the back of individuals who are injured. Mr. Speaker, our plan is a plan that will work. Our plan is a plan that focuses on increasing competition within sector, increasing choice for drivers, so that we can deal with the issues like the member has addressed, but this is a problem that has its origins, yes, decades ago, and it's a problem that we're going to fix Spons. with a plan that focuses on drivers and what's right for drivers. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. The province approves all auto insurance rate increases. The government has the ability to keep rates from, from going up, but chooses not to. In fact, this Conservative government just approved a rate increase as high as 11 per cent for this year, wow. despite campaigning on a promise to lower auto insurance rates. Wow. Ontario's, Ontarians have seen this before. When the Liberals promised to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent and failed, they turned around and called it a stretch goal. <laughs> Why is this Conservative government continuing the Liberals' disastrous record on auto insurance? Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government is focused on fixing this problem. This government is focused on making sure that our plan deals with the systemic problems by making sure that we have more competition in our market and more choice for drivers. But, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the suggestions that have been made by the opposition, the suggestions, for instance, made by the member from Brampton East. These are suggestions, um, not unlike uh, suggestions that we intervene with an independent regulator, which I, I'm sure isn't what the member was, was suggesting, um, but suggestions that would have increased rates because they aren't thoughtful. They aren't thoughtful about the problem. Mr. Speaker, we will address auto insurance rates. We'll address it with a plan that makes sense, and we'll address it with a plan that's sustainable, not like the previous Liberal government that said they were going to fix the problem and rates kept going up, and not like the NDP that created the foundation of the problem sure. system that we have today. Spons. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. As was mentioned yesterday, it's Invasive Species Awareness Week across the province. 
Many of us have, in fact, encountered problems with invasive species in our ridings. Invasive species pose a significant threat to Ontario's biodiversity, recreational activities, and tourism. Can the minister inform us of what the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is doing to tackle the problem? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, great member from Chatham-Kent Leamington for that question. Here, here. And I'd like to update the House. This is Invasive Species Awareness Week, and I'd like to update the House on what we're doing. Our government is committed to protecting Ontario's environment for future generations. We recognize that the most important thing when it comes to invasive species is prevention. That's why earlier this month we proposed to add 13 new species to the invasive species list. By adding these species, my ministry will be able to develop prevention and response plans so that quick action can be taken to control and manage threats as they arise. Last year alone, our government invested over $2 million in invasive species programs and education. These funds go to support ongoing research, monitoring, and management of invasive species across the province. And I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's great to see what smart, pragmatic work our government is doing to protect and conserve our environment. Initiatives like this are an example of the way in which we are working to make changes that are good for the environment, good for our communities, and good for our economy. I noticed that wild pigs are among the list of species under consideration. Now, I know that we don't have a major wild pig problem in Ontario, but again, our government not is not taking the risk this species poses lightly. Could the, uh, could the minister please tell the members of this House what measures we are already taking to prevent a wild pig population from establishing in our province? Wow. Minister to reply. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks again uh, to the member for that uh, very important question. As I mentioned earlier, prevention is the key when dealing with invasive species. Since the fall of 2018, we have been asking the public to report wild pig sightings. This plays a critical role in understanding the locations and number of wild, kids, wild pigs in the province and will inform future action. Earlier this year, my ministry launched a pilot project, which includes on-the-ground follow-up in areas where reports suggest there is a high likelihood that wild pigs are present. At these locations, ministry staff are actively engaging with landowners to learn as much as possible and using trail cameras to confirm these reports. By adding to the list of invasive species, Response. my ministry has further tools at its disposal to regulate, prevent and respond as threats emerge. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you. Uh, my question to the Premier. The government's Employment Ontario and OW and ODSP Employment Services pilot program has the providers extremely concerned about the quality of services and potential job losses. In Hamilton, Niagara, a foreign-owned company will take over, and in Peel, a foreign for-profit company will be responsible for employment services. No municipal partners were selected, causing AMO to raise their concerns. Because of the pilot, the City of Brantford is preparing to lay off staff. To add insult to injury, we know that similar privatization programs in Australia and the UK did not work. In Australia, for-profit employment programs were described by their own Senate as being not welfare to work, but welfare to nowhere. Did the government consider the local job losses and failed privatization programs in Australia and the UK before choosing the Hamilton, Niagara and Peel providers? Mr. Labor, training and skills development. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the uh, member opp opposite uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my uh, top priority, the government's top priority, is to help people uh, find jobs in Ontario. And it's clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that when it comes sure. to our unemployed in the province, uh, we've got to get this right and do do a better job. Uh, Mr. Speaker, back in 2016, the Auditor General uh, made that very clear. She said the system clearly uh, isn't working. One of the uh, major statistics that I find unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, and I question why the opposition would defend it, is the fact that every single month, Mr. Speaker, only 1% of people that are on ODSP 
and OW are getting off those systems, Mr. Mr. Speaker, at a Order. time, Mr. Speaker, when 200,000 jobs are going unfilled every single day. We're not going to defend the status quo. We need change when it comes to employment services uh, in the province. But, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to help people put. Thank you very much. The supplementary question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Employment Ontario, ODSP, and OW are not sufficiently supporting the people who rely on their services. But the solution isn't to just sell them off to, a for to foreign companies at the expense of taxpayers and vulnerable people. These companies will push people into precarious, low-wage jobs because their bottom line is profits, oh, not people. Yep. They get paid when a job match is made, even if it's an inappropriate match. FedCap, the new Hamilton Niagara provider, was investigated by the U.S. Department of Labor in 2018 for failing to properly pay their employees, shorting benefits, and illegally deducting fees from paychecks. They were ordered to pay almost $3 million to 440 employees in 17 workplaces. Wow. They Question. swindled their own employees, What's and this Conservative government has put them in charge of finding jobs for vulnerable people in our province. Will the Premier admit that this is yet another ill-conceived, costly mistake from his Conservative government? Minister of Labour to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me again be very clear that the Auditor General highlighted um, what has been happening for 15 years in this province. Mr. Speaker, every single month in the province, Order. one million people on ODSP and OW, and only one percent of, the, of them are finding a meaningful job. Mr. Speaker, Position we come have to, to order. improve the system for these people. Mr. Speaker, unlike the current system, the three successful promoters will actually receive funding based on their results. It'll be a performance-based system. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General Order. also told us that the current uh, system Member for that's Windsor West come to order. unemployed people in the province also highlighted that 40 providers missed their targets and only four of those providers actually had their funding reduced. Mr. Speaker, this is a Response. system that's been defended by the NDP, by the former government for decades. It's clearly failed our most vulnerable. We want everyone in Ontario to share in the prosperity that's happening. Thank you very much. That concludes our question. Order. Order. That concludes our question.